I'm thinking of killing someone, doctor. I'm not sure anything quite prepares you to hear those words. I've heard it a few times over the course of my career, but you never quite get used to it. And this moment, hearing it from this patient, it feels loaded with emotion. I'm thinking of killing someone, doctor. The young man sat before me in this tight, enclosed room on our hospital ward has been going through a difficult time recently. He's been struggling with his mental health, struggling to contain his emotions and his anger. And he's asked me earlier in the day to speak to his consultant to consider an alternative medication for him. And we decided that actually he was better off sticking with the plan that we've been, we already have in place. And I've told him this already. I asked you to do something and you didn't do it. That's the next thing he says. All of a sudden, my back's up. All of a sudden, goosebumps. All of a sudden, all the hairs stand up. How does this relate to the first statement? I'm thinking of killing someone, doctor. I asked you to do something and you didn't do it. My mind processes the danger as he stands up. I stand up too. He goes to lift up the table between us. I bring my hands down to prevent it hitting me. Pull my alarm, step back, dash out of the room. Staff arrive, crisis averted. I've told this story before in different forums, but and even though it happened some years ago, it's an experience that never quite leaves you. You know, I've worked in forensic psychiatry for a, a while now. But this remains lodged in my mind. And thankfully, occasions like this are few and far between. Or if my mother is watching, never happen at all, wink emoji. But one of the things that I found challenging in the wake of this incident where this patient nearly assaulted me was not the moment, but was the next day. In the moment, caught up in the emotion of it, supported by the team, I kind of felt okay to get back about my daily business. But when I woke up the next morning, I suddenly felt uncertain. I suddenly felt unsure about going to work. I felt this hit of anxiety and I wasn't sure if I had it in me to return. But actually, stripped of the adrenaline of the moment, I found myself unsure whether I wanted to go back into that same environment, wanted to face those same challenges, wanted to have to deal with whatever was going to be before me, maybe see that same person again. I felt unbelievably unsure about returning that day. And I wonder if maybe on some level, in some way, you're feeling unsure about the return as well. You know, we've been exploring this idea of the return over the past month or so now, maybe more. We've been looking at what it will mean to go back to life that was more like how it used to be for us as individuals and as a church. And by this stage, it might feel like we're laboring the point, but the prospect of a return is so significant that it is worth spending the time that we are spending on it. Because we may not be facing up to the idea of coming face to face with an angry patient, but we are facing a huge shift from how life is now. Yes, we're hopefully going to go back to life that's more like how it used to be. But actually, for many of us, there might be reasons why we're not sure about that return. Much has changed in the past year. We've faced many challenges. Some have experienced much trauma. And perhaps some of us have come to like some aspects of our present situation too. I'm imagining that there are many reasons why people might be unsure about returning. You know, perhaps there's the fear or anxiety related to the virus itself. Perhaps there's concerns about catching it or spreading it or giving it to someone that you love. Maybe there have been upsides to lockdown that you're not keen to leave behind. Maybe you've found a more sustainable rhythm. Maybe you've had time to spend time with your family. Maybe you've done more exercise or more baking. Maybe you don't want to go back to the stress of how life was. Maybe you're worried about becoming overstretched or overwhelmed. Maybe you've had a difficult experience in the past year. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've made mistakes. Maybe you feel like you haven't made the most of the year. Hurt, shame, disappointment, all these things can make us unsure about returning. Maybe too, you're not sure where you stand with some people because you haven't seen them for so long, because your only interaction with them has been online. As Pastor Tom and Helena have so eloquently outlined recently, there is something about engaging with people online that changes our interaction, that polarizes it, that skews our view of others. 
maybe not only individuals either, maybe there are issues with church. I can't imagine that we've done everything right over the past year. Maybe you have questions that you want to ask. Maybe there are issues that haven't been resolved. Maybe there are concerns that are lingering. These too can make you unsure about the return. And all of these all of these issues are understandable. All of them are valid on some level. But, but I want to take a different approach today. I want to ask, what if I could change how you feel about the return without resolving any of the issues that I've just listed? What if there was something that would change your response without addressing any of the above? What if there was something so significant that everything else that concerns us pales in comparison? To explore this, we're going to look at a life of a man whose experiences make my opening account feel like a walk in the park. He's a man who was responsible for a good chunk of the New Testament, who inspired the early church with his input and whose words have echoed through the ages since. A man called Paul. We're going to read from a letter that he wrote, first of all, to a church in Corinth. But before we do, I want to speak to those of you watching that maybe wouldn't call yourself a Christian, who wonder what on earth it is that you tuned into, what on earth is going on. I just want to encourage you to join us on the journey as we continue to explore this because I can't promise that you will agree with or like everything that I have to say today, but I can't actually promise that for anyone watching. And I think that all of us can learn something from what we see here. For reasons that we won't go into, Paul, as we're about to read in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul is kind of seeking to assert himself and his authority. And he starts off by outlining his credentials as a teacher, but really what he goes on to is some of his experiences. And it's that bit that we're going to really focus on today. But let's look at 2 Corinthians 11. And we're going to look from verse 22. Paul says, speaking of other teachers, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped many times without number and faced death again and again. Five different types, times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, not like that. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who, are who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Paul has had a rough time. And I would think about this passage. I used to think about this passage often actually over the winter when our team was gathered in the room that we're in now, in this freezing cold room to broadcast church online. And as we stood shivering with the heating off to avoid ruining the broadcast, I often thought, maybe what we're going through isn't too bad. Because just look at what Paul enjoyed here. Paul was whipped to within an inch of his life. He was beaten with rods. He went on long journeys. He was in danger from rivers and from robbers. Paul endured many long and sleepless nights. He was hungry and thirsty and cold. And as I read all of this, as I read Paul asserting his experience, there is one question that comes to my mind, and maybe you're thinking it too. Why, Paul? Why? Why did you keep going? Why did you keep working? Why did you keep coming back for more? Why did you keep returning to this role that you had carved out for yourself if it was so hard? But actually, Paul himself gives us the answer. And perhaps most clearly, we actually find it articulated not in Corinthians, but in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul is writing, and again, he's pushing back against other teachers, but he writes this in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. He writes, that Though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I was without fault. Paul here is asserting himself in terms of how Jewish he is. He is outlining his credentials. He ticks all of the Jewish boxes for success by birthright and by religious observance. Paul was the best of the best. But I once thought these things were valuable. 
but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when, I can, when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and be one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul had spent years here searching for significance through religious observance, but he found something in Jesus that no one else could match. He had followed the Jewish law with absolute dedication, had been radicalized to the point of even hunting Christians and arranging for them to be put to death because he saw them as a threat to Judaism. But he did it all to find meaning and purpose. And how does he describe those experiences here? He says that they are garbage because nothing else compares with knowing Jesus. Paul had had a radical encounter with Jesus. You can read about it in the book of Acts where he was blinded by a vision from Jesus and it took days for him to recover his sight. But when he came back round, when he was able to see again, he changed his name, he changed his attitude, he changed his entire life. And it's clear that he's still desperate to know Jesus more. When Paul writes about righteousness, what he writes about here is about having right standing, right relationship with God, about knowing God with no restrictions. And Paul is clear that he could not achieve this himself, that despite all of his own efforts, he couldn't make his way up to God. But only through Jesus could he connect with God. It is Jesus' death and resurrection that made that possible. Jesus, who took on himself all of our missteps and mistakes, all of the stuff that the Bible calls sin, giving his life that our wrongdoing might be put to death with him. Jesus, who through his death and resurrection made it possible for each and every one of us to know God personally, unhindered by the things that we have done wrong. And some of us may relate to Paul's desire to get close to God through our own efforts. And many more of us will associate with this idea of striving for something more. Paul found something in Jesus and nothing else could compare to it. This is partly why Paul was prepared to put aside such suffering and endure such hardship. He had found something in Jesus that he couldn't find anywhere else. But it's not just a sense of what he found that inspired Paul. It was also his sense of what's to come. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things. Me. No, dear brothers, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on through Christ Jesus is calling us. Paul was inspired not only by his relationship with Jesus, but he was seen. which inspires him to press on. Paul was driven by a desire to tell people about Jesus. His own experience was so profound, so life-changing that he gave himself fully to helping others find radically transformed. And he was driven beyond all reasonable limits to spread that message far towards health and wholeness, towards peace and fulfillment, towards satisfaction and a clearer sense of self. Salvation. Just. Two are called to help others to purpose as his ambassadors as examples of the life that is made possible in relationship with God and maybe this is something that you've experienced yourself maybe this is the first time you've heard about any of this
difficulty, but he did so willingly and boldly because he was caught up in a godly cause. throwing ourselves into the return but may I suggest today that while all those may be valid none of them should stop us from returning why because nothing is a means to know him take our fear and anxiety for example That the safest place that you can be is in the center of the will of God. Really, mate? Why don't you try telling that to Paul? Why don't you try telling that to the whom was in prison for life? Why don't you try telling that to the hundreds, thousands of Christians who were martyred to establish the early church and countless others who have been martyred since? Why not try telling them that the safest place to be is in the center of the will of God? The truth is that the safety is not a reliable indicator of the will of God at all. Because God calls people to go beyond what's safe and secure, to step into the risky realm of faith and live lives that were made for something more. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't take the risks for the sake of it. We're fully compliant with the restrictions. We're diligent about them to the point of irritation, perhaps. I'm not suggesting we should go around licking the surfaces or coughing on each other. What I am saying is that aspiring to safety as your primary goal will rob you of the life that God is calling you to live. The same is true of comfort. For all those who have found respite in the restrictions, who have pulled back from a more strenuous rhythm of life, that is all well and good. It is to be commended. But do not allow comfort to guide your approach to the return. Because just as safety is not the highest calling of the Christian, so too comfort is not our highest calling either. Now, I'm not re advocating a return to an unsustainable rhythm. I'm not suggesting that we should aspire to burnout. You only have to listen to some of my other messages to see what I have to say about this. I fully endorse a pattern of life that gives weight to rest, recovery, family time, and whatever else may have been neglected before. But we cannot allow comfort to constrict our calling when we were made for something more. This applies too to anyone caught up on their missteps and mistakes over the past year. Anyone who feels embarrassed or ashamed. You know, Paul had many reasons to feel like he was disqualified from pursuing the purpose of God. He had persecuted Christians for goodness sakes. He had hunted them down and arranged for them to be put to death. But shame should not set the boundaries of our future when Jesus had wiped the slate clean. When Jesus has opened the door to a life with God that is no longer defined by those things. Nothing that you have ever done nor will ever do needs separate you from the love of God. Nothing needs separate you from his purpose. Jesus has dealt with it all. And holding back because of those things is actually borderline offensive when you consider all that Jesus has done to deal with them on your behalf. Maybe you felt discouraged over the past year, so did Paul. He struggled so many times with disappointment. He questioned his own strength. He wrote about the suffering that he experienced. He even doubted his abilities as a speaker. But our own lack of strength or skill should not limit the life we live when Jesus can be at work through it all. Whatever may occupy our thoughts when we consider returning, whatever may hold us back, nothing is as significant as salvation. There is a reason to return that eclipses all other issues, knowing Jesus and helping others know him too. I hope that I'm getting a sense of this across today, but let me come at it from another angle. Let's think about marriage for a moment. Imagine there is a single man enjoying his life. Here he is, this young man, this young man, he eats what he likes. If he fancies a takeaway, he has it. If he stays up late for a McDonald's, there's no one to judge him for it. He doesn't have to tidy up. It's his house. He leaves his dirty clothes wherever he fancies his laundry. Ah, he doesn't have to put that away if he doesn't want to. He can play video games all night. He can go out when he likes. He can stay up late and no one will ask a question. But then this young man meets a woman, one he comes to like. One he comes to really like. He likes her so much that he gets married. And then he finds that the rules have changed. Because the expectations are different. A clean, tidy house. Healthy meals, including ones without meat. A budget. No games console. A house where everything has its place. 
How many of you know that the sensible young man will set aside his list for this list? Why does he do it? For an easy life. No, 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 I'm joking. I'm joking. Why does he really set aside his own desires in favor of those of his wife? Why is he prepared to work against his own nature to live this way? Why will he give up what he wants to better suit their relationship? That's right. Love. Does his list change? Maybe over time it does. Maybe he learns to load the dishwasher sometimes without prompting and put away his own clothes. Maybe he even turns down a McDonald's when he would be fully justified in having one. But at first his list doesn't change. He just discovers something that matters more instead. This is the point that I am making about salvation. I'm not dismissing any other issues or anxieties or concerns. I'm not seeking to put aside your questions or to belittle your experience. I'm simply suggesting that there is something bigger than all of them. That nothing is as significant as salvation. That when it comes to returning, your relationship with God and your part in helping others find a relationship with God is more important than everything else. That knowing God is so meaningful that everything else finds its place beneath that aim. And that, that fi helping others find him, him should be the context within which everything else is set. When it comes to the return, whatever reasons you have to, set, to hesitate, I encourage you to return regardless. That's the title that I've given to this message. It is a two-word summary of all that I'm seeking to express. Return regardless. Regardless means despite the prevailing circumstances, despite what's been said or done. It means not being, not being affected by something. It means without concern. Regardless means doing it anyway. Return regardless of your fear or anxiety. Return regardless of your missteps or mistakes. Return regardless of your embarrassment or shame. Return regardless of your weakness or uncertainty. Return regardless of your questions, issues or concerns. Return regardless of whatever holds you back. Because what you're coming back to is bigger and more meaningful than whatever stands in your way. Nothing compares to God's love for you. Nothing compares to his purpose for you. Nothing is as significant as salvation. So whatever else may hold you back come back anyway it's time for us to return regardless and in the few minutes that I have left I have one thought of how you can apply this in your life take it personally and sometimes people tell us not to take things personally this is something we have to take personally because Paul's focus here is on knowing Jesus personally. That is where it takes shape for him and that is where it will take shape for us, our personal relationship with Jesus. You know, for some, you don't yet have that relationship, but in a few minutes, I would give you the opportunity to join us in a prayer to connect with Jesus, to find that relationship for yourself, that relationship that so transformed Paul from a man who was seeking and striving, living the worst version of himself to someone whose name written in the history books, who played a role in influencing countless lives, that kind of transformation, that kind of acceptance and love and freedom and forgiveness and purpose and hope can be your experience too. If you will personally connect with Jesus. You know, for others, maybe, maybe you once had that relationship, but actually it has fallen by the wayside. Maybe not that you've disconnected or dismissed Jesus entirely, but actually you've just kind of ended up doing things your way and you don't really pay attention to him anymore. I mean, maybe you're still in the habit of watching church. I guess you are if you're listening to this. Maybe you still pick up your Bible sometimes or throw up an odd prayer if you're desperate, but, but actually you're not really personally engaging with Jesus. Maybe it is time to try talking to him again. You know, you can know a lot about Jesus without knowing Jesus. This isn't about having all the information. This is about having a personal relationship with the Son of God. We also ought to take Jesus' purpose personally. Paul was sold out for the part that he had to play in helping other people to connect with Jesus. What if we took our, that purpose personally too? What if we decided that it is our personal responsibility to help others come to know Jesus? What would that look like in your life? What if we decided that it was our personal responsibility to be ambassadors for Jesus in every situation, to make our world a better place, to show them what life looks like when God is in charge? Why don't you write those words in your notes? Why don't you write it in the chat? Take it 
personally. The vision of our church is the salvation of our city and our town. And maybe we need to come back to that central focus. What might it look like for you to take this cause personally? Maybe it would change how you connect with your friends, your family, your colleagues. Maybe it would change the way you contribute to church life. Maybe you can find other ways to bring that sense of salvation. Maybe it means turning from being the critical person to being the positive person in your workplace. Maybe it's encouraging others. Maybe you have an idea for a business or an organization that could transform an area of our life to bring people that are far from God or, or far from valued back into relationship with him. Maybe you can find other ways to bring all the fullness that God has to bear in our society. That's partly why I went back to work the day after that incident, because I feel called to help the people that I work with. It's not just a job, it's part of the purpose that God has outlined for my life. As I draw things to a conclusion, I hope that you will take this message personally. I hope that you will take it to heart. I hope that it will stir something in you. The big idea today, the central concept is that nothing is as significant as salvation. That whatever may hold you back from returning, it pales in comparison to the love and purpose and power of God. So that you should return regardless. Return to the life that is possible as the restrictions ease. Return to our church community. Return to God. Return regardless of whatever may stand in your way. We've seen over the past week or so a shift in the season. Spring has gone and summer has come. I want to declare another season today. It's comeback season. Maybe you want to put that in the chat. It's comeback season. It's comeback season for me and it's comeback season for the people in my world. Let's take this personally. It's time to return regardless. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray right now that people would experience your presence in the same way that Paul knew you. That wherever they're watching, whether in this moment now or in the days or weeks or months to come, that they would know you, Lord Jesus, close at hand. Your word promises that if we would draw near to you, that you would draw near to us. And I pray right now, Lord God, that this would be a moment for those who have been walking in step with you to, to know how close you have been through this pandemic, Lord God. For those who have who've taken steps away from you to draw near to you again, maybe for those who've never known you in a moment to make that decision to connect with you for themselves. But as we draw near to you, Lord God, I pray that you would ignite in us a passion for your purpose. That we would know that nothing else is greater than the calling that you have for our lives. That we wouldn't allow safety or comfort or fear or anxiety or issues or concerns or anything else to constrict our calling. But that in this moment, Lord God, we would have a God-given sense of the difference that we can make in this world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.